Hey everybody, this is Brad Duck saying hi, how you doing? Today is going to be a little, this is the logical video that I'm going to do and I've been hit by several people now who have asked a very complicated question, but within their simplified networks at home. Um, double zero, double one is one of them, he knows who he is. Uh, what he has asked about, and I've been doing this at different levels because I didn't want to step on anyone's small footprint, you know, because it is your lab, it's no one else's, and you know what you want to do with it. But I am going to do a video here suggesting some ideas. So you guys, yeah, oh, excuse me, so you can understand uh, some options which you can expand into from what you have today. Now, 99% of the time when you start a home network, you'll have one switch that can integrate to your ISP. That would be your router or a provided router by your ISP provider. Uh, then there would be uh, a second switch that you could choose for like management, uh, sort of like an ILO management or a console management switch. Uh, it's just a normal switch. It's just, it's a sec second switch connected to your second port. So you have one for basic traffic and one for management. But let's say you don't do that. Let's say I'm not that I'm not that sophisticated. How about I have one port for internet traffic and front end and one port for backup? Well, you can do that. In the beginning, start out with using two static switches. That's one here and one there. One is connected to the internet and to the ISP interface. The other one is not. It's not connected to anything. It's just between your internal boxes. Any box you want to use for backing up, or you want to use for management, or you want to use for console. And what I mean by console is um, ILO's IP-based uh, interface low-profile access systems, uh, KVM on Cat5, those kind of setups are all kind of like management kind of connections. But by using two standard switches unrelated to each other, you have the maximum isolation, and now you can play. So you run one connection to a machine that you can terminal into from the other side, and that guy can manage all your nodes on the second switch because he has two connections adjoined to both networks. Now, you can also do this via by VLAN, but you better know what you're doing. And what that is basically is you get a bigger switch that can do layer 3 and VLAN management, and it's a managed switch by the way, it's not a static standalone switch, which is not manageable. Uh, this guy you can go in and you can profile uh, VLANs. Uh, a lot of times this is done for like PLE, telephone, SIP networks that they want to run on one VLAN, VLAN, usually called SIP1 or something like that, uh, and it's a PLE switch, so those ports can power the devices that would run on that VLAN. But it's totally independent of the next VLAN, which would be your PC VLAN, and your next VLAN, which could be your management VLAN, your next VLAN could be um, backups. So the key thing about VLANs is you associate them by ports. So if you have four servers, then you should set five ports up for the first VLAN, five ports for the next VLAN, and so on and so on those port interfaces will be physically associated to the VLANs and they will be unique. Now, on the switch itself, you can attribute the VLAN so that they can pass through to gateway pathways to router destinations when you need it to get to the ISP if necessary. Um, or you need to alternate the route to, let's say, a Cisco 2950 uh, or a series SIP router switch platform or something like that. Um, the value of doing that is you've taken a single switch and you created three networks using VLAN technology. Now, let's say you're a data center person, you've got your hands on four or eight boxes, uh, pizza boxes style switches, and they're all managed switches and they can do VCs, or it's virtual connections, or trunk or TCs, trunk connections, or they can do parallel modem, which is a giant huge connector that goes on the back that, that creates what's called an avenue trunk from switch to switch to switch to switch. These are all basically the same thing. And if you have access to such a switch, 
or multiples of switch, you can do a couple of cool things. Now, the first thing you can do is you can just duplex switches. That's just two connections to the next switch, to the next switch, to the next switch, to the next switch. And they're all VC'd or they're trunk connected or whatever parallel type class ID you have for the switch, may it be Nortel, Bridge, Juniper, Cisco, and so on. Everybody has a different term, but it's still the same thing. It's basically known as failover trunking. That's where two physical ports basically are in a read hot state, and if one fails, the other one engages and continues traffic load. Uh, BGP is out there too for big traffic loads where you're going to use four ports and you want to duplex them together to create pathways. Another option is you can what do what you can call full duplexing, which is also a type of failover, but it's called an adaptive bandwidth configuration where you're able to do reads and writes at the same speeds. Now, to do that, you need two physical fiber optic connections so that they can assume each role. Uh, full duplexing interfaces is better than a single network connection because a single network connection is awesome reading or writing. But to full duplex, you need multiple connections. To, to adaptive load balance full duplexing, which means you would need three or more connections. And what that leads to is being able to have a big trunk out there. Let's say you have eight fiber optic connections that are one gig each. You put four of them on to the next switch and you create an adaptive load balancing. And you're going to see three gigabit bandwidths out of that trunk, which is excellent. And that's really cool. Same thing if it's 10 gig, same thing if it's 2.5 gig, same thing if it's 100 gig. Do your research on the switch to make sure you properly set it up correctly. Very important added detail to that is MTU. Check your MTU values. Make sure you're running at least a 9,016, 9,012, something like that, so that big frame packeting, jumbo packeting on everybody else's firm, a variation on the same term, is being able to move large chunks of data through transparently. Because the default is, I think, 1,500 still, which is not good. That's like a 100 a TX100 connection. So with that being said, I've talked to you about taking your switches and playing with them some. Now, I can't go into the specifics of each vendor because vendors like to play around a little bit to make their product better because of the way they present the graphical or CLI interface. The truth is, know the protocol, it's there. Just know that. You know TCP and you know the layered effects, you know MGPM and and oh geez, there's so many different protocols out there, uh, including BGP. Um, they work to the protocol every time. So know the protocol, then it's just a matter of working through their menus or through their CLI configurations to get where you need. Now this leads us to the final component, two by two failovers. Now two by twos, four by fours, six by six, eight by eights, 10 by tens, and so on, are for core data centers. Now, these are the big boys. If you've got yourself a DXC or a Series 2 or a very large 8U or a 12U kind of rack enclosure uh, switch setup, uh, in there you would have to have four of these master switches. We call them master switches because the servers are connecting to them for everything. May they be the VLAN side of the equation for whatever, including FCOE, which is fiber channel over Ethernet. Hey, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and um, other environments. But the key, 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 key detail is what we call the X formation deployment. So, what does that basically mean? Well, in your data center, your giant data center with six or 800 you know, connections to each switch, they have what's called the trunk blade, or usually that they should do correctly, they'll have two trunk blades. Now, let me explain. In the master switches, when you're dealing with them, uh, DX series, bridge series, CX series, and all the different variations, these are big switches. And instead of having uh, a slot for ports, they have what's called blades. And these blades have a lot of resources in them. Let me give you an example. So, basically what we have is, you're familiar with the NIC, the standard network interface card, i.e. Uh, NIC. 
But when you're dealing with blades in a master switch system configuration, like an HP Pro Curve or something like that, you will have what's called edge interfaces, like this. Uh, now these are for a different type of communication protocol, but imagine this times 28, 48, and so on. And there's a lot of them. And each blade, let's say, has 64 ports, right? And you have 16 slots for blades. Now, you also have two independent buses for data transfers that combine together to act as a full duplex environment. So you have failover redundancy inside this huge chassis box. But it gets more complicated than that. Um, you have to put what we call controllers in. So they, they each take a block component, usually on slot 0 and slot 8 on the 16 slot configuration or the 12 slot configuration. Then you have what's called your trunk blades and there'll be two of them. Now this is where the magic is. So many times what we'll do is we'll put the controller blade in which is the processor, the MPU and all of that with the RAM and all the resources and encryption. Then we put in the what you and I would refer to as your trunk. And you've got four of these big switches and you can do this with small pizza boxes too. It's just got to think about it. And now these trunk blades have high bandwidth connections, 100 gigabit, 10 gigabit connections, and so on and so on. And there's probably 16 or 32 ports. So what happens there is, imagine you have four of these switch chassis, each with these redundant pathways, each with two pathways each. So there are two controllers, two trunk bridge cards, and then they cross over to the next and to the next and into the next, creating an X box kind of format of cross, uh, what we call the cross busing. So having that cross busing, switch number zero and switch number three, all have the same common path. And if somebody goes in there and takes out switch number four's pathways, it doesn't care, it's gonna, go, I'm sorry, correction. Switch number three, to take out its pathways, it's got alternate pathways to another switch to reroute the traffic through what we call to commonly referred to as PIIO mode. And this allows you to have a really super highly redundant, high bandwidth structure. Now this is usually done via two or three different ways. In the old days, we had these giant copper cables that would be 200 gigabit bandwidths. They basically ran the backbone of the chassis and they would run that cable to the next switch and then to the next switch and so on and so on. And all the switches were fairly local. Now, there's a problem with that. Copper, right? So they moved to the world of fiber. That worked a lot better. We had two switches on one side of the data center, two switches way in the back, but they were a full fabric, four crossover, fully redundant, fully duplexed, fully uh, adaptive load balance lead configured switches. And all of the data center's resources are put into that to provide serviceability to the customer base, to our employees, and so on and so on. Can you do this with some simple pizza boxes like X3300s, uh, Junipers? Yes, you can, but it's a little limited. You can't double up too heavily because at that point in stage, you just run out of ports. So the 3300 series has four 10 gig equivalencies slash VC fiber optic ports. You can take those boxes and create a crossover fabric solution. Now, like I said at the beginning of this video, you guys have your labs. You're playing with stuff. You got layer one, layer two, you got simple switches. You know, you have an ISP provider set up and stuff like that. And it's kind of basic. Uh, it could be somewhat sophisticated. It could be really sophisticated. Each one of you are different. And I honor that in that regard. But uh, I've had a lot of you just kind of say, come on, give me some more ideas. What else can I do? What can I go after? And these are some suggestions. Now, there's one last kind of fun thing to do with, let's just say, the pizza boxes, right? Because you can get your hands on pizza boxes a lot easier than you can get on the, the bigger switches. And that is ISP servicing. Now, what does that mean, really? Well, that means... 95% of you have routers in your homes that act as firewalls between your ISP connection 
and your home networks. Proper procedure. The classical switch router that you can buy, like a Linksys or a Cisco or a Netgear and so on, is good for the household. But not usually very good for you because it's central networking strategy. You could have some fun with this. Now, depending on the quality of your router, like I have a, a router that actually uses all the bandwidth of my one gigabit connection to the internet. Most of the routers out there today do not. So if you get a 500 gig connection or higher, and you're just getting two or 300 megabits, it's because the router was never designed to translate that kind of bandwidth. Buy a better router. Buy a newer router, do your research. But if you do have a good router and you can port select, take one port and designate it like 172.0.0.1, non-routable, and then have the other port or ports on your, your switch setup be your home network for TVs, Wi-Fi for the family, you know, a local PC network for PCs and so on. Why did you segment the traffic away? Why not? Because if you can segment your traffic and you can even use quality of service to make sure that the house traffic gets, let's say, 35-40% of the bandwidth, the rest goes over to this 172.0.0.1 and I need it to do video runs or server services or replication stuff that you want to do in your lab. So you segment it away. Can you do this in another way? Yes. PFSense. It is a Linux OS system that is a firewall router setup. I have one of these down in my basement. I used it for a little while and then I shut it down. I need to play with it some more and do some other cool things with it, but I'm kind of in a process where I'm just handling the workloads and making sure everything is good. PFSense is really cool. If you have quad cards or you have dual cards and so on, put a few of them into a telecom style rack mount, which means all the stuff's on the front of the chassis, not on the back, and you can just connect right up into your switches, or you can just put it in a tower or something and just run your ISP connection directly to the NIC of the PFC as your inbound traffic unit. And then let's say you have um, a quad card in there, right? So you have, um, let's say a 500 gigabit connection and you have a quad card. One of the cards goes to the switch that services your home and the other port will go to a restricted switch in your IT lab. Now, if you do that, uh, you can then go in again and you can, you can quality of service the connection bandwidths so that the house only gets so much bandwidth, but the rest of it belongs to your lab. Now, this is, stick with me on this, all right? It's a little complicated. If you don't remember, we've built, we have an ISP router out there that connects to your PFC Sense firewall router system that has a single inbound and now we split it out to two. Okay, now, could you do three or four? Yes, you can, but let's keep it simple. Stupid, right? So you run that connection into your lab environment, and in there you have a 48-port switch that you like. It's manageable. It can do layer three and down, and it can do multiple VLANs. Now, the first eight ports are dedicated to IP management, so you can do IP consoling for SSH or something like that, directly into that one port on each of your servers. So you can do basic uh, console management. Uh, the next four are for the phone system that you have in the house. I have an OB set up and the OB runs out and it runs PoE outputs, which are just you know little power supplies that you put out there that look like this. They're basically a small box like this that has a power output connection on the one end. It has two RJ45 heads on the top and it is designed to take the normal network traffic in and then it provides power for the actual uh, PoE device which you're working with. Now, what would that look like? Well, it kind of looks like this. You'll have what's called the local versus the PoE, and the PoE goes out to the device, and this is for cameras, it can be for phones, it can be for anything that requires power over ethernet bandwidth. So with that being said, then let's say you want to 
segment your cameras. Another VLAN, right? The cameras may have one endpoint, which is used by a firewall restriction, that which has a web service on the VLAN number one, which is the one that has internet connectivity, and that allows you to access your VDR camera system and see all your screens. You see the complexity here and how quickly it can become unique? So the, the trick here is understanding how many options you really have. Take a minute, you know, download the manual for your switch. See what it can really do. If you have simple switches that are unmanaged and so on, they can serve a purpose. They can serve a purpose at a place where you just need extra, you know, RJ45 connections. But it makes a connection back to a bigger switch that's more functional. All of it has value. And you can build every bit of this with static switches. And back in the day when you saw all those network switches in the racks, that's what they did. Those CINCOMs and all that, you know, they'd have four or five in there for, you know, for consoles. You had four or five in there for X. You had four or five in there for IP internet traffic. Four or five for X and Y and Z and so on. Then the VLANs made it more feasible to put those into single switches. And then using virtual connection bridges between switches, you could share the VLANs through all the device switches in your environment, making it more of an enterprise environment. Complicated, yes. Functional, absolutely. If you get it down pat, it's pretty awesome to do. Here is my suggestion. Work with adaptive load balancing, spanning tree and trunking. Try that first. Just improve your bandwidth. Secondly, go to your router interface, whatever you have. May it be a, a Linksys 6500 or a Cisco switch or your high end or your low end or you've got a $20 router look at it research it you'll find out that most of the low-end routers only handle a tx100 connection you'll never get more bandwidth than that it will be pretty spotty at best research your router interface if you want to go pfsense take a little time design it out spend a little money on the chassis i bought the telco uh, atx chassis it's about it's a, you know, a little bigger than the size of a ATX motherboard, but it flips it to the front opposed to the back. So the power supply, the USBs, the keyboards, the video, the slots on the back, all of that is to the front of the chassis that's rack mounted into your telecom rack. If you check my videos, I have a couple of videos showing that very configuration. Then you put in your quads and your duals and your high bandwidths and your low bandwidth cards in there and dude and dudettes you can do anything you want and it also acts as your firewall and it also acts as your your log server and it's very functional what am i saying here what i'm saying is look at what you got research it you might discover well holy crap no wonder nothing works very good i got a piece of junk router or i got a layer one or layer two switch something really just not going to give me what i want and have some fun. Get some old equipment that does the functionality you're looking for. Bring it into play. Have, again, some fun. If you get sent into the more advanced switches, do some spanning tree. Do some trunking. Do some BGP. Have some fun. Have stupidly big pipes you could never use or maximize unless you've got multiple VLANs. And now you can start stressing those bigger pipes. My whole goal is, is I hope you guys have fun with this stuff. And if any of you are wondering why am I putting out so many videos right now, it's because I have to make a trip out to uh, DC for meeting some people. And uh, so I won't be do pu putting out much out next week at all, if anything. Uh, so I just wanted to go through this real quick for you guys and talk to this um, uh, in regards to having, you know, an idea of what you want to do. What's your next step? So double O double eleven. I hope this served what you were looking for. If not, I'll do my best. Remember, not all of us are as sharp as we'd like to be, and we have to take baby steps. Everybody have a great week. Have a blessed weekend. God bless.